Hi guys. I'm uh, sure you're enjoying your vacation. And I know you've all been thinking, you know, we've really been enjoying, enjoying this time off, but we really miss Mr. Bortz's class. And we, uh, we really miss just listening to him talk for long periods of time on end. So I thought I'd make you guys a video where I could bring all the boringness of the classroom straight to your houses. Uh, and I know I promised you that I was going to tell you all about how Gregor Mendel was wrong, and we were so rudely interrupted. Uh, so I thought that maybe <laughs> we uh, we could do a little video where I could tell you all about uh, how all the things Mendel came up with don't make any sense. And so I've uh, with the uh, zero dollars and zero cents the uh, school board gave me, I uh, duct taped these two whiteboards together and stuck them to my wall. Uh, and I thought we could use this as a uh, platform to talk about some Punnett squares for traits that are a little bit more complicated. Um, so when we look at genetics, we want to remember, first of all, that we're still talking about pairs of chromosomes. So anytime we have a pair of chromosomes, we need to remember that they have the same genes. But we have different alleles. Okay, so if we're looking at a chromosome, any any two places on the same part of the chromosome are going to be the same. So if you have a gene for eye color here, and we have a gene for eye color here, well, you can't really see that on the camera. Let me make that a little bit bigger, a little bit bolder. So if we have a gene for eye color here, and we have a gene for eye color here, can we see that now? Perfect. Uh, they're not always going to be the same, right? And so since we know DNA is the instructions to code for proteins, each of these are going to make a protein, and they're both going to go to the same part of the body, uh, but they're not going to always be the same protein. Now, Mendel didn't know this, and he thought that one of these would always overtake the other. But if you stop and think about that, well, that doesn't really make any sense. Uh, if you're hearing a lot of noise, that's the street. I live in the middle of downtown. Sorry, kids. Um, so when we look at these, uh, so when we look at these two genes, we got to remember that both of these, let's see if we can make this make sense, are going to make, and we'll just kind of scoot over to the other side of the board. There's going to make some kind of each one's going to make some kind of protein, right? So we've got protein A, and we have protein B. Um, can we see that with the glare? OK, we'll pretend we can read those two words. Um, in fact, we could actually rewrite them. Can you guys imagine me rewriting something to make it look neater? I know it's out of character. And so the final phenotype we see in this person is always going to depend on how these two proteins interact together. I mean, this is often wildly oversimplified into one of these proteins is always going to dominate the other, and that's simply not true. Because if you think about it, if you think about, say, like a human, for example, how many traits in humans only have exactly two options? Do you know, are there only two skin colors a person can have? Are there only two heights a person can have? Are there only two nose shapes a person can have? Even when we look at something as simple as like eye color, if you look at somebody with brown eyes, two people with brown eyes never have the exact same color eye. And so when we go and we look at this a little bit deeper, these this idea that we have of phenotypes and genotypes is a lot more complicated than just, oh, there's the dominant one and there's the recessive one. And the dominant one is always in control. Uh, so what happens when we look at these two proteins and how they fit together, there are thousands of different things 
that can happen. I mean, we're going to talk about some of, a few of the really simple ones right now, uh, but we want to keep in mind that we're just talking about some of the ways this can happen, right? And then when we look at how the two proteins made by the chromosomes are going to fit together, there's thousands of different ways that can happen. Um, and if we have in our heads that there is just one way it happens, it, it's not really an accurate representation of life. Um, because when we look at human traits, they're incredibly complex, right? So sometimes we do kind of see this thing where one of them looks dominant to the other. If you have a brown haired allele and you have a blonde haired allele, your hair looks brown. Because if you think about a brown protein and a yellow protein, when you mix them together, you still get brown. Imagine you had brown paint and yellow paint, you mix them together, you'd have brown. But all traits aren't like that. If you think of something like human hair, you could have super curly hair, or you could have super straight hair, but you could also have hair that's kind of in the middle, what we call wavy hair. So if we look at human hair proteins, we have a straight, the straight protein, and the straight protein is straight. And if we look at the curly protein, The curly protein is actually curly, right? So if you have a protein that's this shape, like me, and I don't know if you can see it on the camera here, but I've got really tight curls, your hair is going to be curly. And if you got a protein that sticks straight, well, your hair is going to be stick straight. But some people have both proteins, and what happens is they get mixed together, and if you have wavy hair, no. <laughs> My uh, videographer here is telling me that's not how you spell wavy. Um, and uh, if you have wavy hair, you have a straight protein, and wrapped around it, stretching out that curly protein, right? So what we have is we have a curly protein that's kind of stretched out, right? So if you imagine you took like a slinky and you stretched it out, and it would be really good if I'd actually think to bring a slinky to this demonstration, but I didn't. So, you know, maybe you could do that at home. Uh, what you see is you get a protein that's a curly protein that's kind of stretched out. And instead of having tight curls, you have these long kind of loopy curls. Um, and so what we do, when we, we call that trait incomplete Dominance. Okay, and I'm going to post a PowerPoint online uh, on our Google Classroom that has these definitions written down on it. But basically, what you have when you have incomplete dominance is you have two proteins and they work together to create a brand new phenotype. Okay, uh, so imagine we were doing a Punnett square. Um, all right, so we have a Punnett square here. I'm going to make that straight Punnett square. That's not too crazy. So imagine we have this Punnett square. Okay, and we're going to be talking about hair. So imagine we have a dad with curly hair and a mom with straight hair. Uh, notice in this case, uh, we use different letters uh, for, unlike a Mendelian trait where we use the same letter where one is capital and one is lowercase, here we're using two different letters because, well, one's not dominant over the other, and if we use the same letter, we get ridiculously confused. Um, so we use a capital letter for one trait and a capital letter for the other one, right? So we remember that if a parent has two curly-haired alleles, they're going to be curly-haired. If you have two straight-haired alleles, you're going to be straight-haired. And if you have a curly-haired allele and a straight-haired allele, now we realize uh, that our hair is going to be wavy. Um, and hopefully we can read this. Maybe we can zoom in on this for one second. Perfect. 
Okay, and we'll just leave the camera right there while we're doing these examples. We good with that videographer? Thanks, videographer. Cool. Um, and so <laughs> what we have here, so imagine, so if we're going to do a Punnett square, we do everything exactly the same way. We put dad on one side. We put mom on the other side. We fill in the Punnett square. And here we see 100% of our, our, our children have the genotype of one curly hair allele and one straight hair allele. And 100% of our offspring would have wavy hair. Right? And so when we see this phenomenon, we have two proteins that kind of mix together. Um, however, I'm going to lift up the camera to pick up my eraser. Uh, cool. Thank you, camera person. Um, this isn't always the case, right? Not all proteins. If you think about protein shapes, they come in a million different shapes and sizes, and they don't always work together. Uh, so what we see when we make two, sometimes we get two proteins, and we mix them together, uh, and they don't fit together. And so this is going to be something like, um, if you think of like a black and white spotted cow, uh, there's a protein for white, and there's a protein, I'm just making up the shapes of these proteins, by the way, uh, but there's a protein for white, and there's a protein for black. Um, I didn't explain this that well. Let's change this black shape one. Uh, now you could imagine that you could fit a bunch of black proteins together, and you could imagine that you might be able to fit a white, a bunch of white proteins together, but the black and white proteins are totally different shapes and they can't fit together. Um, and so what you end up seeing, if you have something like a cow, and once again, we can use my uh, world-class art skills here, Uh, to picture our cow. Let's give her a nice squishy tail. Uh, so we have our cow here, and we might see a cow where we have a patches of white protein, and we have patches of black protein, um, and that's because these proteins can't fit together. Um, and so we call this trait incomplete dominance, and once again, there'll be a PowerPoint online that's got all these definitions written down for you. Uh, which you can consult at your leisure. Uh, but if we have a co-dominant trait, uh, what I like to do to remind myself it's co-dominant uh, is use two lowercase letters, right? So we might have a parent here in this case, or I guess I could have just left these up here. We'll just add the allele. So if you have a white parent, we might use two little w's. We might have a black parent, and we've used two little bees. Uh, and if we have a spotted person, uh, we'd use a little bee and a little w. Uh, this would be spotted. Um, so once again, we can run this through a Punnett square. So let's say this time uh, we have a spotted father, and we have a, I used two capital letters, and we have a black mother, we could drop these bad boys into a planet square, and we could figure out what the offspring would look like. So we fill in our planet square. And then what we'd see is, we, then we can look at our genotype ratios. So we have 50% of them that are little b, little b. We have, that's not where the percentage sign goes, it goes next to the number, Mr. Ports. You took fifth grade math? I guess you didn't. 
Uh, we'd have 50% of them that are BB, and then we'd have 50% of them that are BW, uh, and then we'd have 50% that are black, and 50% that are spotted. Okay, so we can use Punnett squares for traits that aren't necessarily Men Mendelian because we we remember that every single organism in the world, for every single gene, gets one copy from mom and one copy from dad. And as long as we keep in mind what we learned when we talked about uh, protein synthesis and we remember that both of these genes are going to make a protein, we can use a Punnett square even for non-Mendelian traits, right? So even if a, if a trait follows a different rule than we're used to, uh, we can still use a Punnett square to predict uh, how traits will follow from parent to offspring. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to answer. Uh, otherwise, good luck. Have fun. Enjoy working from home. Bye, guys.